Hallelujah to the King. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today. Lord, we know, oh God, that our spirits are willing, but our flesh is weak. Strengthen us today, Lord. Raise us up again, oh God. Help us to redig the wells of our fathers, that your glory might shine in this place again, that the hungry and the lost, the broken, the rejects, the people that nobody wants, oh God, will find your house and find their life and strength in you. You're an almighty supernatural God. You don't need advertising or people to promote you, Lord. You can do it yourself. And Lord, we come here today, oh God. And Lord, you know my heart. And I ask you just to take control of this preaching today, Lord. You speak. Speak to the hearts of the people, Lord. And move us, oh God. Move us, stir us, oh God, to get with you, to get on your program, oh God. And live, oh God, as you would have us to live, that we might be the people of God in this place. We beg of you your anointing now, not only on myself, but on your people, Lord, that we might be one in thought and in action. Have your way today, we pray, and we beg these things of you through the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. And we ask for the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. You may be seated. Praise God. I want to thank God for Lady Dorothy. Thank you. I want to tell you a story about perspective. You know, perspective is how we see things. A man rushed into the house in a panic-stricken state. His wife looked at him and said, what's wrong? He said, we're in deep trouble. She said, what is it? He said, it's the car, it's the car. What's wrong with the car? She said, water, water. There's water in the carburetor. And the car won't work. His wife just cocked her head to the side a little bit, narrowed her eyes a bit. She said, but now, honey, wait a minute. You don't have a mechanical bone in your body. And the both of us know nothing about automobiles. How in the world do you know the problem with the car is water in the carburetor? husband hung his head and said, well, the car is in the swimming pool, so there's got to be water in the carburetor. How many know that this is our problem? Our problems can be a lot bigger, amen, than what he said or what we say. And lots of us are more messed up than we look. We may simply say that there's water in the carburetor when our whole life is in the pool. But we dress it up, fix it up, talk right, lay it out, trying to make it look like there's only a little water in the carburetor. No, we need to give our whole life to God. The whole thing, you know. I'm saved 30 years or more, still struggle with giving God my whole life. I gave him my life, but it's given him my whole life, the entirety of my life. When, my, when I want to do things that are not necessarily sinful or bad, but they're not uh, in my best interest, but I want to do them anyway. How many know what I'm talking about? You're looking at me with that face. You know, like chocolate chip cookies in the middle of the night, haagen ice cream, amen, for the second helping. Come on, talk to me. Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. Praise God. I hope you're clapping that you're going to come ready to pray. We're going to pray for people to get filled with the Holy Ghost. We're going to pray for some people to get refilled. 
with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Need you to be here. Amen. Amen. Invite your relatives. Invite your nieces and nephews. Pentecost Sunday is the kind of Sunday that God will show up and show out. And so, you know, when the fire came, we had this saying, amen, it's a mantra. And a mantra is something that you say that keeps you going, keeps you focused. You know, uh, Dr. Webb came, he travels all over the world, and he said that in the countries he goes to, when he talks to the people, uh, they think America is better than it is. They think America is greater than it is. They think the church in America has everything. But he said when he talked to some people uh, that uh, visited America, they said, well, the church in America is great, but American Christians, amen, are not focused. He said we're easily distracted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I thought about that. And I believe that God wants us to get on track. Amen. How many know that Peter was walking on the water until he got distracted? Can't be distracted right now. God's on the move. We got to move with him. You know, some people want to move on their own time. But no, you got to move on God's time. We got to move when God's moving. Touch your neighbor, say, neighbor, I will be touching you. Tell them, neighbor, every setback is only that we might take a step back, that we might make a comeback. Now look them in the face and say, bounce back, baby. Bounce back, bounce back. A young couple got married, was on their way home from the honeymoon, and an 18-wheeler, a tractor trailer, pulled out in front of them suddenly, and the young groom swerved to avoid it. The car went into a tailspin and crashed, turned over. The groom was okay, but the bride was bleeding profusely. He knew that if he did not get his wife to a doctor, she was going to die. He got out of the car and he saw a sign just a little ways away. And it said, the office of Dr. Rufus Jones, internal medicine. He picked up his beloved in his arms, struggled up the hill towards the doctor's home. He began knocking on the door. And, the old, and an old man came to the door and the groom said, Dr. Jones? And the man said, well, yes. He said, my wife is bleeding, she's dying. Please save her. And much to the young man's surprise, Dr. Jones said, I'm sorry, son, but I can't really help you. You see, son, I stopped practicing medicine many years ago. I don't have any equipment here. I don't have any medical supplies. I stopped practicing medicine a long time ago. Distraught and with frustration and deep grief, the young man said, Dr. Jones, if you no longer help hurting people, then please take the sign down. Please take the sign down. Church, we have a world out here that's bleeding to death. Yesterday we told people to come to church, but when they get here, when we offer them Miss Dr. Jones, what I mean by Dr. Jones is, uh, you know, are we going to offer them pop psychology or something we heard Dr. Phil say? We must be very careful that we don't give uh, so much of our own thoughts and opinions to people. How many know that we're not psychologists, but we are Christian ministers and the children of the living God? Our medicine is the love and deliverance that comes from being full of the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost is in you, amen, he fills you. And there's something that's missing in many Christians' lives. They don't have the joy of the Lord. There's no joy in the salvation. They're saved, but I'm not happy. 
We want to share the healing power of the word of God. In order for that to happen, you and I got to be right. That means for, in order for that to happen, you and I got to make sacrifices. Right. Yesterday we told hurting people to come to the hospital. But how many know that if we tell them to come, we must be ready to be a spiritual hospital? If we're not going to give them what we, if we're going to give them what we need, we've got to be a spiritual hospital. How many people know that the antidote for sin is the soul-cleansing, life-giving blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? There's an answer for sin, and it's the, the blood of Jesus. How many people know that there's a sign outside that says, Love Gospel Assembly, big, you can see it on the other side of the concourse. The Church of the Living God. When people come in, it's our job to create an atmosphere of worship. See, you can't come in and expect them to worship. They can, but we should be worshiping to the point where there's an atmosphere. They can sense there's something in the air. By which hurting people can receive ministry from the Holy Ghost. They should feel the Holy Ghost when they come in the steps. Before they get into the temple, they should feel that there's something drawing them and say, you're welcome here, come in here. People are touching them and saying, come, you're welcome in this place. Let's either look at your neighbor, tell them neighbor. Let's be... Let's either be the real hospital or then let's take down the sign. When we're not pursuing God, what happens is we come to church looking for God. I need, I need, I need. But, you know, if you've been saved for a hot minute, and most of us have been saved for hours, weeks, years, decades. We shouldn't come to the church so hungry, amen, for God for ourselves, but full of God, amen, for others. I'm not coming so the worship leader can pump me up to worship. No, I'm coming, amen, because I'm going to worship. Amen. I'm on worship because I'm a worshiper. The worship leader didn't save me. Thank God for her. She was worshiping today. But I can't base my salvation if she's going to be able to save me. No, my salvation is based on Jesus, my Lord of Lord and King of King. And when I come in the church, I'm going to worship him. It don't matter how I feel. It don't matter how I look. It don't matter what happened. It doesn't matter what's going to happen. I'm going to worship Because there's people here that says, well, mm, the preacher looked like he's serious about this worship. You know, one of my big, big disappointments right now is if you go to any of the Muslim stores around here, when it's their prayer time, they lock the door. They be right down there on the floor. You could bang on the door, ring the bell. They don't care. They be right down there. If they in a subway platform, they'll put that mat out and be right there in the subway platform. I seen them do it on Fifth Avenue, right in the middle of people walking. I seen it with my own eyes. So they're willing to worship God anywhere at the appointed time and they don't care. And we got a problem worshiping God. That's why I don't believe that we got the real God. Because our timidity in worshiping God. You know, Pastor D told last week about how she went in and the lady saw her and asked her, are you a Christian? And she said, yes, I am. 
But for every Pastor Dorothy that will say, yes, I am, there are many that say, no, I'm not. Because I don't want to be called out. I, I don't want everybody to know that I worship Jesus. Because when you worship, people talk about you. And, and people point fingers at you, Elder Rosa, and they'll say things about you. But I don't know about you, but I don't care what they say. I don't care, and I don't care. I, what? You lost your mind. Let me tell you something, boy. Jesus saved my life. He redeemed my life. What? Don't worship him. That's like saying, don't honor your mother. You talk about mama, it's going to be, it ain't going to take long. I take off my shoe if I have to. We're, we're, we're timid to worship God in public. This is why I was watching Hills, Hill Street, the song, because I'm saying, Lord, what are these people doing that they fill in stadiums? Hill song, thank you. Thank you so much. Praise God. I, I knew you wouldn't let me down. <laughs> they got loads and loads of young people. This is not their country. They come from Australia down on door. And the churches are packed out. You know why? Because three quarters of the service is straight up worship. I hear the songs, they're not great songs in my opinion, but the people are worshiping God. They're not singing, they're worshiping. And the songs all reflect who Jesus is. And they're jumping up and down and dancing and doing all kinds of things and they don't care. Now, you know, there is a difference between their dress code and ours because I'm from another generation. You know what I'm saying? I don't have a problem with you wearing a T-shirt, you know, if that's what you, what you feel you have to wear, you know. But if I was going to see somebody that I deeply respected and I cared about, I wouldn't wear a T-shirt and jeans with holes in it, you know, because what you think is a fad is what used to be my clothes. Oh. What? Jeans with holes in it. I'm in a different gen. See, that wasn't a fashion statement. That was a reality of my poverty. Can I talk about it in here? Because you're looking at me like I'm crazy. So for us to put a suit and tie on and go to church, that was something. We were saying something. We want everybody to know I'm going to church. That's why I'm dressed like this. That's why my shoes are signed, Deacon Allen. They're signed because I'm going to church. I'm going to see Jesus, and I'm going to be looking sharp when I get there too, baby. So there's a fundamental difference in our, uh, you know, where we are. But I ain't got nothing against them. You come to church any way you can come. That's not, I'm not knocking that down. You know, sometimes I've come with my sneakers and my workout clothes on and all kind of different stuff. And when I used to work, I used to come with my work clothes on and my boots. And anybody that's been in this church used to see me do that. It's not about that. But you need to know who you are and you need to know the God you're worshiping. And so, we need to come prepared to worship God and love God. So most of the time, the people get saved in the worship service. They just don't know they're saved. They make a commitment. They sense God. They want God. They open up to God. And so, what I want us to do is to know that... Uh, that we're going to be a real church. 
Touch your neighbor. Tell them we're going to be a real hospital. Right? Let's not have everybody thinking that we are a spiritual hospital with practicing physicians and when they show up, they die at the doorstep because we stopped being a church a long time ago. Touch your neighbor. Tell them let's be the church. The authentic representation of that which Christ Jesus gave his life for. Amen. Hallelujah to the King of glory. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 26. Am I, am I helping anybody today? I hope so. I hope so. I hope I'm helping somebody. We were talking about... Um, Genesis 26, and we're going to use verse 14, we'll start there, and uh, we talked a couple of weeks ago about redigging the wells of our father, and the Holy Ghost gave me that. I said, Lord, what do you want me to tell the people? Amen. To redig the wells of their father. It says in verse uh, uh, verse 18, it says, Then Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham, and he gave them the same names which his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of flowing water or springing water, so the herdsmen of Gerer quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac, saying, The water is ours. So he named the place Essek, which uh, means they contended with him. Then they dug another well and they quarreled over it too. So he named it Sitna, and he moved away from there and dug. They contended with him and dug another well and did not, but until they did not quarrel over it. So he named it Rehoboth. And he said, at last, the Lord has made room for us and we will be fruitful in the land. Praise God. And then he went up from there to Beersheba and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the Lord of your father, Abraham. Do not fear for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there, and Isaac's servants dug a well. Praise God. And so, what, I, what if I told you Isaac had deceived his neighbors? You know, when we read Old Testament characters, we think that they're uh, flawless, or they, they're without sin, or they're without failure or weaknesses. But if you read it, you'll see that everyone, only Jesus is perfect. You know, he deceived his neighbors. He said, well, how would he do that, Bishop? In fear for his life. He had went to see uh, uh, Abimelech, who was a great king in that land, and he was afraid because his wife was beautiful, amen, and they would kill him for his wife. So he told them that his wife was his sister. But what happened was, even though uh, he had failed, God didn't fail. See, even though he messed up, he repented, amen, and fessed up, and God fixed him up. See, the whole, the whole thing is not about the weakness. We got the weakness. I don't care what anybody says. The Bible said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. We have weaknesses, failures, propensities, all kind of different things. And so did the people in the Bible. He had faults and failures. Amen. But God was faithful to the covenant he had made to his father. The only thing God asked Abraham to do and what he asked Isaac to do was stay in that territory. Touch your neighbor. Tell him stay in the zip code. Every challenge that comes is to get us out of this zip code. Because as long as we're here, we have the power of an almighty God with us. 
God also blessed Isaac because of Abraham's life and faith. It's found in Genesis uh, 26, 5. Amen. God blessed him. He says, uh, he says, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and give your descendants all these lands and your descendants all the nations of the, through your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my, my, com, com, my statutes and my law. Amen. And I'm after something today because many of us are living within ourselves and for our generation. But I came to tell you, amen, that God, amen, is living and wants to live through you in all of your generations. Amen. Touch your neighbor, tell him this ain't just about you. The lady that stopped Pastor Dorothy prophesied and spoke about her youngest son. In other words, the blessing is coming down through you, Pastor Dorothy. But I'm not going to stop with you. I'm going to keep on going down and get Stephen. I'm going to get your grandchildren. I'm going to get all of them babies they making. I'm going to have them all. Because you have obeyed me. Wow. And so, just like uh, Isaac was blessed for this, uh, for uh, just like Abraham was blessed, amen, Isaac was blessed, amen. And you know what? If Abraham and Isaac can be blessed, you and I can be blessed. We will never know until we get to heaven how many of our blessings have been the dividends from the spiritual investments made by godly friends and family that have gone before us. And I said this to you before. There are people that live before you. They never saw you, but they prayed to God for you. And that's why you can do some of the things you can do. You can do things and you don't know, but there was somebody ahead of you that looked back and said, God, don't ever let my granddaughter be treated the way I'm treated. God, I'll serve you in the midst of my situations, but I need to know that you're going to come upon my family and you're going to raise up someone in that family that's going to proclaim your name. You're going to raise up someone in that family that's going to pray for the rest of the family. The family could be big, but God only needs one person. I don't need a hundred, but if I person will obey me and pray for that family, I'll save every last one of them. Touch your name and tell him, you know, he must be preaching to you because your face don't look, your face look like your face look funny. We have the opportunity by, by how we live and serve God that the same way that God blessed Isaac because of Abraham, he will bless our children and our grandchildren because of you. What a God. You know, people tell me, oh, you know, you don't know what my family, I don't care what they do. They can do whatever they want to do. Our job is to pray. And that same person, God will shine that light. And that same one, oh, hallelujah. Come on now, you looking at me like giving me that baby clap. You wasn't always saved. The family gave up on you. They said, you never going to be nothing. You the one we don't like. But God said, that's the one that I want. Oh, I'm going to take her. The one you wouldn't help. So that when she gets where she's going, you can't say you had a part in it. And she'll have to give me the glory. You mad because they won't help you. God says, I don't want them to help you. Because when I raise you up. The Philistines tried to get Isaac to leave their land and settle elsewhere. Do you know how many bids we've had of money, millions of dollars to leave? And so to encourage him to leave, they stopped up Abraham's wells with dirt and deprived Isaac's flocks and herds of water that they desperately needed. Water was a precious commodity in the Near East. Adequate wells were necessary if you're going to succeed in the land. What I want to show you, you're going to have a fight. 
touch your neighbor, you're going to have a fight. Amen. But how many know that God already won the battle? Oh, hallelujah. Stay with me now, church. Stay with me. Don't, don't leave me. No matter where Isaac journeyed, stay with me. The enemy followed him. Oh, they're over at the school now. Let me go over there. Oh, they, oh, oh, they get, oh, 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 the balcony's starting to get full in the school now. That's 1,500 people. I, I got to work on some of my people in the school to get them, to put them out. After we paid our money. Everywhere we went. Amen. The enemy went right behind us. Every well that they dug, they came back and put dirt in it. Enemy was following them. Touch your neighbor, tell them the enemy will follow you. The enemy followed him, confiscated his father's wells, and also the new wells. After he dug new wells, they came and took those wells too. See, Isaac was kind of a laid back guy. Abraham was kind of a feisty guy, you know. Abraham wouldn't have put up with that, amen. But God, but God still blessed Isaac. Amen. Because even when you don't fight and give your battles to God, how many of the God will fight the battle? So no matter whether who you are, if you're someone that will step up real quick or someone that will lay back, God is on your side. Because when Abraham talked to them, they knew that this is the guy that God is blessing. This is the guy that beat five kings with all the people in his own house. All he took was the people from his house. And so they, they, they took the wells that Isaac's servants does. In those days to find a well of springing water was a special blessing for it guaranteed fresh water at all times. But the Philistines took that well too. You know, they found a well and the well was gushing up shooting up spring, spring water, amen. See, that's a blessing because sometimes you had to dig 100 feet down to get to a well. When you found a well that was springing up, that was God. You know, Jesus said, my word is going to be like a well springing up. Oh, yeah. my, my, it, it's going to spring up. And so, uh, Isaac men dug uh, wells, the, pro the problems that he had with his neighbors, amen. He named the wells what they originally was and the new wells that he, that he named, he named them contention or hatred, amen. Because when you're serving God and God starts to bless you, people get jealous. People get jealous. When they see you starting to move, they, get, they, they, they can't help it. Amen. And, and the people all around saw God's hand on Isaac. Saw God's hand on Abraham. And so uh, this is what happened. But stay with me, church. Say this with me. Rehoboth. Say it again. Say it to your neighbor. Rehoboth. Rehoboth means enlargement, Pastor David. Because Isaac found, finally found a place where he was left alone. They just kept digging, but he kept digging the well till they got tired. Touch your neighbor, say, your enemies will get tired. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm talking to somebody now. And it says that they finally left him alone. And in that place, he began to grow. Amen. And he had room enough for his camp, for his flocks, for his herds, and for his people. This is what that is about. In other words, they want to build, amen, amen. And we know that we want them to build, amen, the way that we agreed to build so that when they get finished, we won't just have a room or a floor or an office. We'll have Rehoboth. They want to try to give us something else. We say, no, we need Rehoboth. Why? For the generations that are coming. For the kids that are coming back. 
for the people that will be saved. We need a space that's big enough. How many know that when you start talking like that, God starts getting up because God say, well, now you're talking like me because anybody could ask for a room. Anybody can ask for a couple of uh, spaces, but you're asking for a huge place. And the only way that can give you that is me. God is saying, ask for big things. God is saying, don't back down. God is saying, stand up to the giant. Don't back down and believe me for big things. I need Rehoboth. Why? Because I'm growing. I'm not going to get smaller. I'm going to get bigger. And the devil's whispering, you know, you're older now. You retire. Your, your life's just about over. Tell the devil, you are a liar. What? And we will not stop until we're home. You say, why is it taking so long? That's why it's taking so long. Because the enemy doesn't want to give up the land that don't even belong to him. Hear me, my brothers and sisters. There came a day after years and years and years. Amen. And there's coming a day in your life when your prayers will wear the enemy out. This is why he don't want you to pray. Because every time you pray, it's a knockout blow. Every time you worship, it's a knockout blow. Every time you quote the scriptures, every time you talk to somebody, he can see the handwritings on the wall. If I don't stop her now, what will she do? If I don't send trouble this way, what will she do? But one day, your prayers will overcome the enemy and he'll just give up. He said, because it seems like I can't stop her. No matter what I do, he keeps on keeping on. No matter how much pressure I put on him, he worships God anyway. No matter who I send, no matter when they come, no matter sickness or health, this person cannot be stopped. If you're a fighter, fight. Amen. If you're a fighter, why are you getting upset because they want to fight? You're a fighter. Oh, you want to fight. Real people that fight, when you jump up in their face, they be like, oh, you want to fight. You sure you want to do this, right? I'm giving you a chance to go now. Because real fighters fight. Some of the old timers that have been in this church 25, 30 years. What? Ha! <laughs> Lost your mind. Your prayers brought God's fear upon your enemy. Say it with me. Rehoboth. It sounds strange, but when it's going to become a word in your vocabulary. Rehoboth. That means when I get the place that I need. Touch your neighbor, say bounce back, baby. I want to suggest to you today that no matter what they say, and when I mean by they, I mean anybody that tells you you can't make a comeback. I did some research to find the answer to understanding of what the Holy Spirit dropped in my spirit a few days ago when he told me the title of this message is Bounce Back Baby. I asked God, God, what does that mean? You know, what, is it, what does that mean? I went to the library yesterday, asked two librarians, do you have any uh, books on uh, 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 how many times a child falls before he learns to walk. I spent my whole afternoon, I was groggy when I got home. That's why I left, Pastor, because I knew I had to do it. Because the Holy Spirit has spoken to me. That's where he said, that's where the title Bounce Back Baby comes from. 
He said, the question I asked a lot, but they could not answer. So then I got Lady Dorothy to get on Google for me. And Google got me many answers, but they wasn't the right answers either. Went to a website called pdf.semanticscholar.org. And they asked a question. I asked a question, how do children learn to walk? Amen. And then they went through and I found where they found where they had an answer. This is what they said. Children learn to walk by thousands of steps and dozens of falls per day. Say it again. Thousands of steps, some kind of missteps, fall, amen. But what do they do? And God told me, see, I started this when you was a baby. In order to learn how to walk, you had to bounce back. You can't walk if you don't get up. Oh, come on. How many people in here are walking? If you're walking, you can come back. If you can come back, you can bounce back. God said, I started when you was a baby. Before anyone could tell you you couldn't walk, because you didn't understand and you couldn't talk before they could tell you, I put the ability to bounce back in you. Oh, I ain't got no help in here. See, I, I don't have no help. So I came to tell you today. He, God makes it so that if we're going to walk, we're going to have to bounce back. So I came to tell you today, bounce back, baby. Bounce back. Because anyone told you that you could not, we fell down, but we got up a lot. You can do this. Don't know what you're going through? Don't know what your situation, God said, from a little girl, I made you tough. I didn't start when you got big. I started when you got small. I put the desire to get up again. Touch your neighbor. Tell him, neighbor, may the Lord give you many, many wells in this lifetime. Oh, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. May God give you many wells, because wells speak of his blessing. Wells symbolize that he's with you. Wells symbolize his prosperity and his hope and his strength in you. Praise God. Hallelujah. I have about, how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 12, 13 scriptures on wells. All of the things that God, like the lady at the well. And it's all manner of things God did when he met people at the well. Touch your neighbor and tell him, God's digging me a well. <laughs> In closing, in closing, the church keeps looking for something new. Stay with me, church. We're looking for something new. But it says, when all we need is to dig again the old wells of the spiritual life that our people, amen, have dug for us. See, there, there, there are people in your life who were experts, who did things, and we don't know a thing about them. But if we had met those people, if those people were alive, they would change our very life. And it's the thing about taking people captive because then you take away all of their heroes. You take away all of the giants. We don't talk about our family like we're used to. There, but there will be people in here could tell me that people in your family told you, you just like aunt so-and-so. 
you look just like or you talk just like uncle so-and-so. Because God, amen, heard their prayer. And God now is with you like he was with them. Oh, God. The word of God in our hearts, scripture that's living in us, godly prayers in our mouths, unashamed worship from our spirits, unshakable faith, the power of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the willingness to sacrifice our lives and to give God our service by working in the church. Stay with me, church. There are many people, not in this church, but who go to church but refuse to do the work of the church. And it's this way of thinking that allows the enemy to fill their wells up with dirt. Whenever there's been a revival of spiritual power in the history of the church, it's because someone this is what I read up on and I said, God, what are you saying? He said, whenever there's been a revival of the spiritual power, how many want spiritual power? Spir spiritual power. How many believe God got spiritual power? How many believe that God could give you spiritual power? Luke 4, 18. For he has anointed me. It, the revival of spiritual power in the history of the church has been because somebody has dug again the old wells of their fathers. Jerry Kaufman dug some wells in the Bronx, New York. He dug well so great that uh, Pastor Jose from Guatemala, amen, is digging those wells in Guatemala, man. I wish I could take you to see the wells he's digging. Honduras, other countries around, the love kitchen, is it all over Guatemala, all over Honduras, Venezuela. You go there and they got the love kitchen, just like we had here. God told me it's time to get to work. It's time to get to work. God wants us to dig the well of the love kitchen again. He said, because that's an anchor of this church. I don't, I'm not clear on the time frame, but you got to know what you want to do, how long it's going to take you, how much it's going to cost you. I don't know those things yet. But we're going to probably uh, clean out the love kitchen. We're probably going to put another one of the tool sheds in the back of the church. We'll lose some parking space, but it'll give us the ability to redig the well that is the love kitchen. You know, sometimes when we talk, you can get the wrong impression that we think we're proud because we feed the poor. We're not the only one to feed the poor. That's not, that's, not what, that's not what this was about. What it was about is that God gave a poor person a vision to feed poor people. God took a man that was homeless and told him, I want you to strengthen these people and help them to get a house. When the guy that he was talking to didn't even have a house. 
That's, this is the DNA of us. Thanksgiving, amen. We go out, we invite, I mean, there's nothing for us, amen, to have a thousand people in this church on Thanksgiving and feed every one of them. This is our well. This is who we are. And we need to get back to doing what we do. We ain't in competition with nobody. Right? We're not looking necessarily for governmental money, right? Because, uh, but, we, but we, we know that there are things that you can apply for and we will. But we, we do this ourselves. We start off by when we go to the grocery store and we see something on sale and it's four for five dollars or whatever it is, we buy some for us and we buy some for the poor. Right? And we make sure that we do this to the extent that we get a, uh, I don't know what you would call it. We have a whole, what is it Jeff, what do we have? A pantry? Is that the name for it? And, the, the, and we, from that pantry, we begin to feed the people. I don't know exactly how that's going to uh, happen at this point, but I'm going to sit down with the leaders and we're going to figure out what is it going to take to do this. I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to ask possibly and more than likely for your financial help. Amen. No claps right there. So. <laughs> but more than that, I'm going to make, I'm going to make a demand of you. Everybody in this church at some point in time going to have to go down in that love kitchen. because it'll change your life. It'll change your life. That we can become the people that God wants us to become. This is, this is who we are. This is what we do. And God is saying it's time to get back to it. Just being back is not enough. It's not enough. We got to do the work of feeding the poor, clothing the naked, doing after school for the children. Come on, somebody. Teaching people how to read, how to write, how to live right. Come on. That's why we exist for. That's what, we, that's what we exist for. And so, this is who we are. You know, we, we're not giving out a lot of information about the property because, you know, that's what got Trump in trouble. <laughs> giving out information. There's some things that we're negotiating that they're just private. And we can't, we can't talk about those things because we have a strategy. Amen. Can you understand that? Good. So praise God. Don't get upset because we're not giving you a lot of information. You know, when you, you can get 10 people, you know the story. You tell this person, tell the person, you know, that the person is sitting next to them got eyes of blue. And then when it gets down 10 people, they... <laughs> The, purple, the person got, you know, uh, uh, gray eyes. Tell the person with the gray eyes. You know, the message gets so convoluted, we can't, we can't afford that right now. We need your prayers. We need your faithfulness that we're going to get this thing done. We're going to get it done. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's stand to our feet today. Give God the glory. Give, go ahead, give him the glory.
the, 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 the thing that the, the people that come to us can't understand, why won't you take the money? Everybody takes the money. But we're not in this for money. We're in this for love. Hallelujah. We're in this for service. There's a word in the house, church. Hallelujah. Bishop, you know, um, the Lord told me to come up and, and speak this. You spoke about the sign, love God. God showed me the sign, love God's will assembly. And he told me, he said, you know what? If they're going to put that word up there, then they got to show that love. Okay. And then he showed me the, the, the Muriel we had on the, on the wall with the promised land. And he said, do they realize what they're saying? They keep naming, giving these, these very important names because the names in the Bible were very important and they meant something. And there was a purpose for those names. And, and I was saying, I remember, you know, there was backbiting and speaking against the pastors and leader, leaders. And I said, well, you know, if this keeps up, then God is going to do to to love God for what he did to Israel, and, and we did wander. So, and God was showing me that. And then he, he gave me one of the lessons that Bishop Kaufman gave us, that if they want to birth that, they, they got to travail before me. You know, God honors that when we cry out and we travail. He honors that. And so he, that's what he wants of us and expects of us. And the Lord also told me that love gospel is meant to be to have a great destiny, to be glorious. So we have to step up to the plate and we have to join with our leaders and our pastors and we have to do what God is, is asking of us. So I felt led to, to share that with you. Okay. Hallelujah. 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 Let's bow our hearts today. Let, we, we have to be the people of God. I want you to grab the hand of the person next to you. Hallelujah. You're not in this thing by yourself. We're in it as a people. Father, so grateful. Lord, we're your people because we have your blood. Relatives come together. Families are families because they got the same blood, not because they look alike or talk alike, but because they have the same father and mother. Lord, I lift up love gospel. We got a great vision and a great calling but now we've got to become a great people. And great people is based on sacrifice. How willing are we to sacrifice our time, our energy, and our life to build the church, to touch the people that you've called and destined us to touch, to become the church that you've destined for us to be. We're not better than anyone. Oh God, we just want to be what you called us to be. And we want to do what you called us to do. And we want to raise up the next generation, Lord, that they might do and be and become what you want them to be. We thank you today for each and every person here we pray that the vision start to get down in our hearts and souls to realize that we're in something that's bigger than us. This is a God thing. And Lord, you only do big things. So Lord, do what you purposed in your heart to do and use us to do it. Make us a family, Lord. Draw us together. 
by your love, by your covenant. Make us one that we would accomplish the, the desires of your heart. We want to please you, Father. We ask these things in the mighty and, and matchless name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in his name, Father, we say amen and amen. God bless you, church. Thank you, thank you, thank you for staying tuned in today. Did you enjoy today's message? I pray that you did. And I also pray that your relationship with God is growing by leaps and bounds day by day. Now there's so much more to come, so I want you to be sure to like, follow, and share us on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Just type in Love Gospel Assembly and I'm sure you will be blessed by what you hear and see. And in the meantime, be sure to ring that subscribe bell. You won't want to miss all that's coming up. So have a blessed day.